find that God builds a house, his house has been created with a specific purpose and a plan in mind. He did not create his house to be barren, deserted. He did not create his house to be devoid, hollow, vacant. He did not create his house to be uninhabited, unoccupied, and he did not create his house to be empty. No, every house that bears his name bears his name for one reason, because he has a purpose to fill that house. Full of what? Full of power, full of purpose, full of people, but most of all, full of his presence. However, he cannot fill what is not his. We have decided that we're not going to make room for Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit gets to have the room. Holy Spirit, you have the room. We're not making room. You have the whole room is yours. Anybody feel that way this morning? Give God a praise in the place today. Come on, let's give God praise in the place today. Hallelujah. You have the room, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, have the room. If you let's Stand with me all over the room. Stand with me all over the room. Stand with me. Come on, I'm going to give you a reason to praise him. You ready? Last Sunday, we began to pray and we began to prophesy and declare over two people that were in ICU. You remember that? Yesterday, last Sunday at the 11 o'clock and the 9 o'clock service. God, in the name of Jesus, do something in Randy Barfield's life. Do something in Jennifer Ressler's life. They said that she'd never come out of eight. I see you. She's sitting right here on the second row today. Come on. Come on, sitting on the second row. They said she'll never come out. They said she'd always, if she got on a ventilator, it'd kill her. She needed to be on the ventilator to stay alive. And look at her sitting on the second row. Come on, we got a reason to give God a praise in this place today. Hallelujah. He is good all the time and all the time. Coming out of the hospital and in church in seven days. Looky, 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 sooky, sooky, sooky. God is good. Somebody give him a praise. Amen. He's still a miracle worker. So we just say finish the work in Randy Barfield in the name of Jesus. We, we say complete that work. Live and not die to declare the works of the Lord. We say turn the oxygen level around so that it may be a testimony time after time and time again in Jesus' name. We stand according to your word, your will, and your promise over his life. Somebody just praise him right now for what he's doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You could be seated in the presence of the Lord. I come walking in. I've been, <clears throat> I've been battling a cold, so I, it's hard for me. I worship in my office, and they come in here because I don't want to cough and get you all freaked out. <clears throat> or I do want to freak you out, but not because I'm coughing. But so it's hard for me to be in my office worshiping by myself and then slide in to slide up just because of this little tickle in my throat, this cough. <clears throat> but when they, as soon as I walked in, JB said, hey, you know Jennifer Russ is sitting on the second row. I just about tore the whole back wall up because I didn't know. Hallelujah. I mean, I know he can do it, but it's another thing to see it happen. Amen. So we praise God for that, and we just say restored health in Jesus' name. We say greater and more and more. Your ladder be greater than the, than the just thank you for what he got you out of, but praise God for what he's taking you into. Somebody say amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Luke, Gospel of Luke chapter 2, Gospel of Luke chapter 2. That's where we're going to be today. While you're turning there, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It's a, it's a good time of the year. Amen. It is the reason we're all here. Hallelujah. Without a, without a cross, there would be no Christmas. But I thank God for the Christmas child that was given to us. Amen. Listen, um, over the past uh, few months, we've been talking over and over again about not backing up and making sure that we're doing the things necessary that we need to do. And, and so many times I will get focused on what we're doing and move on because I'm a visionary leader by nature that I don't take the time to celebrate. And I just want to give you a little update. Um, there, there are some Christmases that are happening around the world today because of your faithfulness and your generosity, your ability to steward what God has given you, and then entrusting us to steward what God has given through you to him and his storehouse. Talk a little bit more about that next Sunday. Um, but I just wanted to give you an update as we move into this Christmas season. We celebrate Christmas um, of just three things, I've got videos coming in January that I'll show you. They'll thank you personally for that through videos. But um, in this Christmas season, I thought it would be important just to let you know what you're doing, what we're doing as a church family to be a blessing. I thank God for church. But church is not built to be inside the four walls. 
If the sum total of your church experience is what happens in here, you have missed the point of why he created church. Come on, we, we've been built to be a blessing. And I thank God we should come in here to celebrate what he has done and anticipate what he is doing. But he sent us out as ambassadors into the kingdom. And our job is to be his light outside of these walls. Amen. So what good is it to have a knock them down, drag them out, shout them service if it never shows up in the lives of the people that he's put us in? <clears throat> and so on behalf of your generosity and your, your ability to steward what God's given you and then us steward, um, I just want to tell you about three. Number one is Paula Clark in Honduras. We have a ministry there, a missionary out of our church. Her name is Paula Clark, just one ministry. And in the name of soccer, um, football there, in the name of soccer, she goes in and she cre she's created sports programs. And it is her inroad into giving them Jesus. We've seen dozens and hundreds of kids over the last couple of years be one to Jesus through a soccer ball. Hallelujah. She's there. Well, the, um, with COVID in our area in North Carolina, we have inconveniences and a couple places are closed. Well, there the entire nation is shut down. There's nothing happening. And in the middle, middle of this corona situation, they've actually had two devastating hurricanes. And it has wiped out everything made people very desperate, and actually she has been burglarized and robbed the ministry the whole nine yards, unbeknownst to me. I felt prompted of the Lord about four or five weeks ago to send an offering um, to our missionary, just prompted by the Lord, and she, she received the inbox, she emailed me back, and it turned into like a Facebook audio message conversation or whatever, where she just began to cry. She said, PG, you don't understand. We had no place to live. We have no things. We have no couches, and this is a miracle for us. To God be the glory for the great things he's doing in our life um, through there <clears throat> in Honduras. Another, another thing that, that I'm very passionate about is the Native Americans in our own nation. Now, I'm an Indian outlaw, half Cherokee and Choctaw. My baby, she's a Chippewa. She's a one of a kind. And uh, actually, my grandmother's full-blooded uh, Chippewa. And uh, so I got a little bit. Get me into the summer and you'll see it come out a little bit. Hallelujah. But um, I'm, I really, my heart is for the Native Americans of our nation. And um, we're partnered with a ministry in the Dakotas and Montana. <clears throat> and I reached out to uh, Bishop Kemp and I said, hey, what do you need? He said, well, the greatest need we have right now is um, our churches are open, but they cannot afford to be heated to minister. Now, we get ice with a little bit of sleep. This is the Dakotas. You understand? Okay, Montana, the, the Dakotas. And if you don't have heat, there's no need in coming. And so on behalf of you, we have, we have paid in advance five churches heat bills for this winter months to make sure that our Native American brothers and sisters can worship together. Amen. I'm just letting you know what we're doing um, during this Christmas season, what you're doing in this Christmas season, may, maybe even beknownst to you. And then the last thing I'll just say before we get into the word today, we're partnered with a ministry called Every Nation Education. There are missionaries out of here as well. And um, the whole premise behind their mission is real simple. In the name of uh, English education, they go into Muslim nations, and they, they're winning people in droves to Jesus. And they can't go into Muslim nations and say, hey, we're going to be Christians. So they do it. They say, we're going to educate. We're going to teach English. We're going to do these things, educate the people. And in the name of education, they are infusing Jesus. And we're watching radical Muslims be changed over and over and over again. Well, the Lord just opened the door for them to be in Bosnia, And they're actually connected... On the border, it's uh, Kazakhstan or something like that. I can't remember off the top of my head. But it's right there, and there is severe oppression happening with, with one of the nations. And they're actually, families are fleeing the oppression that they're having. And they're literally in the middle of the night just grabbing their children, and they're running. And in this area, we're not talking about Honduras or, you know, South America where it's um, paradise and there's a lot of warmth. In the freezing snow, there are refugee camps of thousands of people that are barefoot because they were literally running for their lives. Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, sow a seed into that ministry on behalf of Judah Church about four or five weeks ago. And Matthew calls me, <clears throat> sends me a video crying. He says, Pastor, you have no idea. I'm looking at the devastation with thousands of people, and they're all barefoot in the snow just trying to get away from oppression. We're stuck in line at Starbucks, and we feel oppressed. Come on, they're barefoot in the snow trying to flee oppression, living in um, refugee camps. 
And the Lord spoke to him and said, hey, um, we need to be literally the hands and feet of Jesus and begin to put shoes. And I just want you to know, we sent that seed. He called me crying. He said, PG, your gift from Judah Church put over 300 shoes on barefoot people in the snow in Jesus' name. <clears throat> and so to God be the glory for that. So we just say, Lord, we'll be more and we'll do more and we'll sow more. As you said, be, let us be a Holy Ghost conduit for you in the highways and the hedges. We praise you for what you have done, but we declare and decree that the best is yet to come in Jesus' name. Somebody ought to just give him praise for people you're going to be thanked by that you don't even know yet when we get to eternity. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. We're in Luke chapter 2 in the series Full House. I was actually, those of you that know me, I plan a year in advance with messages and things like that. Um, but the Lord this week really just shifted my message today. And so I'm much less prepared, but he is absolutely prepared. Amen. Than I normally am. But I, I feel like the, the message that I have today is, is spot on for where we are. And if, if the second, first service is any a reflection of that, I believe it was a word in season, is a word in season for us in this season that we're in. I simply have a question for you this morning are you joyful am I joy full we're in Luke chapter 2 where we're going to read the story of the shepherds here in just a moment but I think the overarching question you and I have to answer for ourselves today is where is the joy meter of our life where, where are we as it relates to the joy. Now, I don't know how long you've been in church, but, but joy is a really big deal for people of God. As a matter of fact, we would say joy to the world, the Lord has come. We, we would sing joyful, joyful, we adore thee. As a matter of fact, when we were kids, we would have the joy, 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 joy down in our hearts. Where? Down in my heart, and the peace, I, I couldn't say it back when I was little, but the peace that passeth understanding down in my heart. You know, down in my heart where? To stay. Because there is something about an abiding joy that should happen in the lives of every believer. As a matter of fact, he said in John chapter 5, verse number 9, that as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. To the degree that my Father loves me, Jesus says, is to the degree I love you. Now watch this. Abide in my love. In other words, I love you, but you have the choice to live in it or not. And most of us receive the love but never abide there because we bump into it on Sunday or we bump into it in crisis, but the desire of God is for you and for me to abide in his love. Watch verse 10. For if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. See, the commandments God gives us is not to keep us from fun. The commandments that God gives us is to keep us in love. There, there is a world of difference in my marriage when I do not cheat on her because I have to versus the ability to demonstrate my love to her by the fact that I am remaining faithful and I am remaining pure. Do you, do you understand? I can do it for law's sake or I can do it for love's sake. But the reason why we walk in that love is so that I can remain abiding in that love. Now, I married a northerner. So number one, if that ever was to go down, I would not be alive. You, every northern woman, hallelujah, amen, cut you in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. But, but for us, watch this, it's not a matter of have to, it is a matter of get to. I get to be faithful to her. Because there is a love that she has given to me that supersedes any love I've ever had before. That was a great place for every married man to say amen, reach over, pat her on the hiney end. Hallelujah. There's a world of difference. Watch this. But if you keep my commands, you will abide. The moment I break that, I lose the abiding love. Do you see it? I'm going to try to make it very practical today. For the, I love you and abide in my love. Keep my commands and you will abide in my love. Watch this. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and abide in his love. Look at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, here it is, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be abide in my love and I will infuse my joy into your life. And I have so much joy that your joy will be. 
you can't handle how much joy I have. But if you'll abide in my love, I'm going to release my joy, and your joy will be full. So let me ask you a question this morning. Where's your joy level? If we were to look at your life and gauge the joy range, where are you at on the joy status? Where, where is your life on the joy? Are you on E? Are you on a quarter of a tank, a half a tank, an eighth of a tank? Maybe you're riding the fumes of joy because of the issues of our life and the situations we're in. The question is, what is it about our life that has now sucked the joy from us? that has removed us from the stanchion and the place that God has decreed you and me to be as it relates to our joy. Here's what I found. Most people mistake joy for happiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Watch this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit, not an emotion of my situation. See, I can be in great seasons of great difficulty, yet have an abiding joy. Even if I'm not happy, I can still have my joy. Let me give it to you in the text. For the joy that was set before Jesus, he endured the cross, despising the shame of the moment. Here he is unhappy with the cross, but for the joy that was set before him, he endured the season he's in. Most of us are only full of happiness, yet we're talking about our joy. Hear me. Happiness is an emotion. I'm not asking you, are you emotionally prepared for this week? The question is, do you have the joy, 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 joy down in your heart? And is it there to stay on full? This is so important to God that, that Paul wrote in, in the, to the church in Romans, in Romans chapter 14, verse 17. He says, look, the kingdom of God is not a bunch of eating and drinking. It's not a bunch of hanging out and partying and doing all this stuff. There's places for all of that. But the kingdom is not about meat and drink. But watch this. The kingdom is about righteousness and peace. And here it is, joy in the Holy Ghost. I'm giving it to you now, prepositional phrase, in the Holy Spirit. Most people are trying to find joy. Joy is in the Holy Spirit. Most people are trying to figure out where joy is. Joy is not in your favorite football team. It's not in your favorite basketball team. It's not in your championship. It's not in your 401K. It's not in whether you got a man. It's not whether you want a new man. It's not in whether you got the money, whether you got the raise, whether you got the stuff. No, joy is found in the Holy Ghost. I love my wife, but my joy is not in her. It comes from the one that joy has been given from. So even if we are fragmented, I can still hold my joy. Because joy is in the Holy Spirit. But if I don't have him, it's hard for me to find it that he brings. Huh. You know, in the season, it's, it's always so funny to me. I get cracked up in the season because really, really religious people will say some really stupid things. Don't you love stupid Christian sayings? Am I the only one? I love them. I love them. Just crack me up. That, that this is the season. Bless God, we're going to keep Christ in Christmas. We're going to keep the Christ in Christmas. And I'm thinking, if we would keep the Christ in Christian, we wouldn't have to worry about whether he'd show up in Christmas. There's a whole lot of people that, that are Christians. And you can't find Jesus anywhere. January through November, but now that we're in December, we won't keep, keep Christ in Christmas right beside Santa and a reindeer with a runny nose. And we wonder why our kids are so confused. Because we have removed the Christ in Christian. Can't nobody see him in us every day except one day a year. I, I, I believe with all of my heart, ladies and gentlemen, that one of the reasons why the church, the people of God, the beloved, have such little joy is because we're looking for the emotion of happiness, asking it for it to be a deep work of spiritual joy in our life. 
And all of that was introduction for a really short message. In Luke chapter 2, verse number 8, the Bible says that there were shepherds abiding in a field. They were watching over their flock by night. Shepherds. They were the lowliest of the lows. Listen, it, you did not have to be educated. You did not have to have a pedigree. If you just wanted to work, with, this was the lowest occupation of the day. The shepherds was the lowest of the low. You didn't have to be smart. You didn't have to have any kind of intellect. This was entry-level pay, entry-level job. All you had to do was sit and stay awake. Let the sheep do their thing, and you just stay awake. It was the lowliest of the lows, and they were there abiding in the field. And the Bible says in verse 9 that an angel of the Lord showed and appeared to them and stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. Watch this. And they were greatly afraid. It's an entry-level job, but heaven has now come to the lowest person in their station. This is what I love about the power of Christmas. That it doesn't matter how hard, high you are, how educated you are, how high you aren't, how educated you're not. That the kingdom has come. That heaven has invaded for the lowliest of the lows. I don't have to be the greatest Christian. I don't have to be the greatest preacher. I don't have to have everything right. I don't have to have a great home life. I don't have to have a certain amount of money or status. That the kingdom, that heaven has invaded the earth and it has gone all the way down to the very low of the lows and that's where heaven starts but I want you to see this heaven has now come to their situation but their response is fear you see it in the text heaven has come the glory of the Lord is showing and they're afraid in other words I was prepared for what I'm used to but something has now happened that I'm not used to, and the natural reaction was, mm, I'm not sure if I want this. I, I'm not sure that this is the kind of experience I want to have. I mean, I just came in, I want to mess with the sheep, I want to kind of sleep, I want to hang out with my fellas, I want to do what I need to do, I need to get my paycheck, but now heaven has invaded, and their response is, Freak out. Can, can you imagine? You go home tonight, and you're just hanging out in the yard, or you're, you know, you're just sitting in your, your, your bedroom, and, and throw the image up there for me. All of a sudden, an angel appears to you. Now, this is not an angel. This is heaven that has now come to your situation. We pray for heaven to come. What do we do when he actually does? See, we keep spiritual things spiritual, and we keep natural things natural, and we ask the spiritual things to invade the natural area, but when the spiritual things does, most often we get afraid of it because we can't imagine he actually did it. They're minding their own business, they're asking for God to do something new, and now he's done it, and they're afraid, and I love God. Because God didn't say, hey, are you afraid? Now, if I was this, I'd, I'd try to freak people out because that's just what I love to do. Anybody else like to scare people? I, I love to scare people. It's one of my favorite things. I will, in the middle of the night, I, or just, I will go outside of my house and stick my face in the window <laughs> while she's trying to wash dishes or something. And I will open my eyes because she's a discerner so she can feel me looking at her all to make her scream. It is one of the joys of my life. If you come to my house, um, I have a, my, my master bedroom is right beside the downstairs, uh, up, you know, up and down. And so I will stand on the side and have her in the living room call the kids to come down from upstairs. Just so when they come, I have this cat sound. I, I will do that and I will as loud as I possibly can. Every one of them fall up the steps in fear and they know it's coming but they can't stop it. It is one of the joys of my life to make people panic. Pray for me, your weaker brother. I would have come in and I would have absolutely tried to do something to freak them out but all God did was show up. But he showed up and he acknowledged and recognized what they were in 
in spite of just acknowledging what he was doing. And he looks at them in verse 10 and he says, hey, don't be afraid. Heaven has now invaded the earth. I can tell you're living in great fear, but don't be afraid. He looked at them and said, I do not want you to take on the identity of fear. Yeah. Get scared. Be startled. Fall up the steps for a minute if you need to. But do not take on the identity of fear. Because I'm showing you something you've never seen before, but I promise you need it. So don't become identified in your fear of the worst case scenario. Because heaven has come, it's freaking you out. Freak out, but don't become identified in fear. If we've ever been in a year where we've had every single opportunity to freak out, to fall up the steps, to fall down the steps, to be startled, to live in an identity of fear. This has been our year with all of the things we've had to incur and go through. But I'm here today to tell you, for all of us in the beloved, we may freak out, we may be concerned, but we can still have joy that is unspeakable and full of glory because we don't have to take on the identity of fear in spite of the craziness that we have made had to endure he comes in and he says don't be afraid it doesn't say don't get freaked out we're gonna get startled we're gonna have questions but I can't allow the questions to become my identity for why look at it for what I'm bringing you What I'm bringing you, you're going to miss if you take on the identity of fear. What I'm about to unleash over you, you will miss if all you see is your fear. If all you can be identified by is the fear over your life, you're going to miss what it is I'm about to do. Look at what he says. For I'm bringing you Good tidings of mediocre joy. I'm bringing you good tidings of pretty good days. I'm bringing you good tidings of a couple good days a week and a couple bad days a week. He says, no, 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 no. No, don't take on the identity of fear. Because what I'm about to unleash over your life is good tidings of great joy that there is something that heaven is about to release that is not just good for you it is great for you i'm telling you it's so great because i'm great and i'm greatly to be praised and god is saying i'm about to release great joy on the inside of your life i don't care how hard march was how hard february was how hard june was july august september october november or even december no i'm telling you don't take on the identity of fear because because great joy is your portion. I'm not talking about get by joy. I'm not talking about have a good week joy. I'm not talking about just pay your bills for a week joy. But I'm talking about great joy. Joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. That even in unhappy times, even in difficult seasons, that there is an abiding joy that rests down on the inside. And we're living full of joy when everybody else is walking full of fear. He's saying this is an announcement of a new season. I'm announcing to you today the announcement of a new season. I'm bringing you good tidings of great joy. Oh, oh have you seen all the sarcastic memes out today? Oh, there's, oh, where's the prophets out now? Prophesying 2021. Somebody going to give me my word for 2021. Ain't nobody going to talk about the word for 2021. Y'all said 2020 was going to be my year. Uh-huh. Ain't nobody saying nothing about that now. Let me tell you something. 2020 is my year. 2021 is my year. 22 is my year. 23 is my year. Why? Because they're all his years, and I belong to him. And even if it's a hard time, even if it's an unhappy time, though, Though he 
slay me, yet will I praise him. I don't trust in my own understanding, but I trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And if he ordered 2020, then he's going to order 21. He's going to order 22 where the hand of the Lord is off of, of the nation of America. Let me tell you, God's not done with America because I'm still in America. And God's not done with me. He's not done with you. He's not done with what he's doing here. This is a season of great joy even in difficult times. Somebody say amen with me this morning. Don't be afraid because what I'm about to release to you is good tidings of great joy. How is it that we and the beloved can live so miserably content? It's one of the greatest struggles of my life is to watch people so full of purpose live so miserably content. Pastor, what does that mean? That means you're miserable. You know there's a move and a shift on the inside, but you're content because you don't want to start over so you can know what to expect. God, do something great, but keep me in my comfort shoes. God, do something amazing, but don't let me lose my status. God, I'm hungry for more. But I don't want to have to struggle to get there. I bring to you good tidings of great joy. Watch this. For born this day of the city of David is a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Look at verse 12. And let me give you a sign that you, this has happened for you because you will find a baby. Now, if you've ever been to Israel, you've been to the Wailing Wild, I'd love for you, all of you to go with me. Even to this day, men and women gather all day long every day praying for a king to return. They're praying for the return of their Messiah. It's easy for me to go there because I'm praying for him to come again. They're looking for him the first time. I'm looking for him the last time. But most often, huh, we get so caught up in the star that we'll trip over the baby. We get so caught up looking for the signs in the heaven that we trip over it manifested in the natural realm. We're looking for the super spiritual thing when what God most often does is wrap it in strange packaging. I need to get a prophetic word over my health. Drive past McDonald's and don't stop. Oh, y'all didn't like that one, did you? <laughs> At all. I need him to prophesy over my finances. Cut up your credit card. Come on. We're looking for something supernatural. And he's already wrapped it in a very natural packaging sometimes. They said, you will find this babe lying in a manger. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes. They are looking for their king, but he's wrapped in two packages. Now, uh, the older I get, the more I've realized that the smaller the boxes, the more expensive they become. When I was a kid, I want big boxes. I like big boxes, and I cannot lie. <laughs> but I realize the smaller the box, the more debt is attached. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> they said, heaven said, I'm going to take this gift, but I'm going to wrap it in two packages. It was a strangely wrapped present for it was wrapped twice I remember when my little sister was very young we went to my grandma's house and they bought her this little bear that she had been wanting or something you know silly but they started out in a refrigerator box and one box led to another box which led to another box which led to another box which led to another box 
She became so frustrated. She's probably six, seven, eight years old. I think we still have a picture. Um, that she became so frustrated, she said, forget it, and she dove into the, all the boxes. Because, watch this, she was so full of anticipation to see what it is that one thing led to a next that she said, I will not get frustrated because it's happening this way. I just will not stop until I see it. Most of us get frustrated at God's packaging. So we miss the value of the gift that he's unlocked on the inside. You're going to find this babe. And not only is he going to be wrapped in skin, but he's also going to be wrapped in swaddling clothes. You are looking for your king. But he will not be in a throne. He will be in a feeding trough. Could it be that the great news that God is releasing in your life for great joy, you already have. It's just taking time to unwrap it. When he releases things with strange packaging. He says, you're going to find this babe wrapped in a manger line and a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. And then something powerful takes place. It says, and then suddenly... In the heavens, full house now, what was an encounter with one angel announcing great joy has now become a heavenly choir with a cool arrangement, church like you've never seen, for the lowliest of the lows, singing one song, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill, towards men. Watch this. Heaven is singing a song over the natural realm of what the natural realm is now receiving. Heaven is rejoicing because what God has allowed to be held up in the heavens is now being released and it's being released by one word called suddenly. I love this word. I'm not going to get in trouble because it's not Pentecost Sunday today. But I love this word suddenly because suddenly means that it was already there. He wasn't creating it. That it was already there. It was already held up. It was already in supply and it was already been directed that this was about to be released. But they were waiting for something to happen that would unlock the lock and allow that thing to be released into their life. In other words, what was there for them was already there for them. It wasn't having to be created. It was there, but it was in stock, waiting on something to happen that would unleash it and avail it into their life. What was it? It was the announcement of great joy coming and their ability to not get locked up in fear and allowed their situation to deter them because it was wrapped in the wrong way to discourage them for pursuit. I believe what God is saying to us today is if you'll not take on the identity of fear, if you'll allow yourself to not always make God do what God does the way God does it, how God's always done it, that the suddenly will be unlocked in your life and what has been held up for you will be released in your life in Jesus' name. Huh. Come on, Chris, I'm done. Good tidings of great joy. Watch this. Suddenly, good tidings of great joy. I love verse 15. It says, when the angels had gone away, watch this, they just had church. I mean, heaven's angels are singing. They just had a choir like nobody's business. Everybody perfect pitch. With no auto-tune. They just heard prophetic declarations over their life. And when the church service was over, they said, I got to go see this thing I've heard. Most of us only have an encounter with heaven in church. And then we leave church and go, well, that was spiritual. Boy, the preacher preached good today. Or we go, that was pretty good. The preacher, 
He did okay today. We go sit at lunch and we go, man, that worship was good today. Or we'll go to and say, man, that worship was a really good try today. We'll go and we'll sit at our lunch and we'll go, mm, that was a good church today. Ah, we might need to keep looking today. Oh, man, and heaven has come and it is a strangely wrapped gift. But it was a prophetic announcement over our life. And we left it right in the room of that encounter. These men said, nope. If heaven is going to take the time to make a declaration over me like this, we're going to go, look at what it says, and see this thing that has come to pass. If heaven is going to take the time to unlock this in my life, that faith cometh by hearing, but I don't want to live in my ears. I want to allow my faith to become sight. Psalm 27 verse 13, that I would have lost heart had I not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord, even in the land of the living, that I don't care. I thank God for the church encounter, for the heavenly host encounter, but I want to see this thing actually be manifested in my life. I'm looking for somebody who's willing to go and see what God said. They're standing in the field. And if you ever go to Israel, I'd love for you to go with me. The field they're standing in is the field of, that, that was purchased by Boaz, the story of the Old Testament of Boaz and Ruth. It's the very same field. Ruth was this nomad who has just lost her husband to famine and is now living with her mother-in-law who changed her name to Mara because she was bitter. Ruth comes into a field, finds favor with Boaz, who is known as the kinsman redeemer. And the Bible says, don't have time, but the Bible says that he fell so in love with this woman who had no business being there that he would tell his servants to leave her handfuls of provision on purpose. He was the kinsman redeemer. Uh, the very same field that the shepherds are hearing the announcement of our kinsman redeemer is the very same field that all those years before the kinsman redeemer is leaving handfuls on purpose. The great, 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 great grandson of Boaz was a man that was known by the name of David. He was once a shepherd who became the king of Israel. He's known in the Bible as the shepherd king. Here are shepherds abiding in the shepherd king's field that was conceived out of the kinsman redeemer, hearing that the king has now come to the shepherds. It's all in the same field. And they say, it's one thing for me to know Ruth and Boaz. It's one thing for me to know about David. But I, as a shepherd, want to see this king for myself. It took, watch this, two hours to walk from this field to get to the cave where Jesus was born in. Never mind trying to herd sheep. Stood there, looked across the valley, right into Bethlehem. Most of us, we, we live in this whatever church tells us to believe. You know, he was in a barn. Listen, the cave systems uh, over there in that culture, they're not barns. There's not made of wood. Wood is a scarcity over there, especially in those days. They would, they would root out caves because in the winter, caves would stay warm. And in the summers, caves would stay cold. So they would come in and they would put them in caves. And the caves were actually the stables. They were the barns in, over there. Jesus could not find room in the hotel. So they allowed him to be born in a cave. 
And most of us give everybody the, the ah, you know, he's a selfish little innkeeper. You know, there was no room for them in the inn and all this stuff. Listen, the reason he had to be born in a cave is because he was going to be resurrected out of one too. He started in a cave. And then we started out of one. Don't get caught up in the semantics. Ah. This particular cave, you have that image for me? This particular cave system is known as the Tower of the Flocks. You have that image? It's known as the Tower of the Flocks. That's not it. It's known as the Tower of the Flocks. Watch this. Every lamb that would be born that could be qualified to be spotless, to be taken to the temple in Jerusalem, to be killed on the altar for the sacrifice of the sins of people, were born and then brought to this place in Bethlehem called the Tower of the Flocks. Only the pure lambs got to make it into the caving system of the Tower of the Flocks. Because these would be, would be grown and cultivated to be sacrificial lambs for redemption. The very same place that all of these lambs have been brought all of these years is the very same caving system where for unto us a child has been born and a son has been given. And the government would be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And he was born in the place where all the sacrificial lambs were taken. <sighs> and you wonder why I love the Bible. It all lines up. They bring him to the Tower of the Flocks and the shepherds say, now let's go see what God said. Verse number 20 is where we're going to live today. After they had seen what God had been saying, what heaven had come down to convey, look at what they said. There is a praise that has got to come out of me because I didn't just hear it. I've also seen it. And I didn't just see it, but I also heard everything that heaven told me has come to pass. Do you know how to remain joyful? Is that when you trust that what God said God will do and you will see I think we started this morning if he said it we believe it it's one thing for him to say it it's one thing for you to believe it but I believe the prophecy over our lives in 2020 Psalm 27 13 that we will see the goodness of the Lord. For that thing which he has spoken and we have believed in our heart shall come to pass in our lives. If you're in agreement with me this morning, slip up those hands and just thank God for the seasons of great joy that are your portions. Come on, just receive that right now for this good tiding of great joy. This is an announcement to somebody who's been in a very difficult season that this is a prophecy for you. There is great joy coming to your house. I'm telling you, your frown is about to flip upside down. And even in unhappy times, you're going to have joy that is unspeakable, that is filled with glory. I prophesy to you today that even in, that the peace which surpasses all understanding is about to stake up a guard around your heart and around your mind. I prophesy over you today that people in your life are not going to understand why is it and how is it that you have joy 
joy, 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 even in the trying of times. I'm here today to decree and declare over you today that joy is your portion. It is not fear. It is not anxiety. It is not isolation. It is not depression. It is not loneliness. No, joy is your portion. Joy, 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 down in your heart down in your heart to stay because you are resting in the abiding love of Jesus and him alone. I just wish you'd let your mouth match your hands right now and just lift up a praise right here all over this room because joy is overflowing. That joy is spilling over. That joy is your portion. Even if you're unhappy, even if you're unsettled, even if you feel a little weird and wonky, I just want you to thank God right now for great joy, joy, joy down on the end inside. Come on, I dare you to stand up all over the room today and just slip up those hands and just say, thank you, Lord, that the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy in the Spirit. Thank you that I am in joy because I am in you and joy abides on the inside of me. Ah, oh, we praise you. Ah, oh, we praise you. Ah, oh, we praise you. Listen, I got just, just a moment. Katie was talking about her mom, Lisa, that was in ICU that had pneumonia and the sepsis, sepsis, sepsis and all that that was going on in her life. I talked to her earlier this week. She sent me a text and told me I still have permission. And, and, and I talked to her on the phone earlier this week. And I said, Lisa, tell me. Tell me the challenge of being in ICU. And this is my heart has been really praying for Randy. She said, she said, Pastor, it was the hardest thing I've ever gone through. She said, because while I'm listening for the voice of God to say I would live and not die, I'm listening to death happen all around me in the ICU. She said, I would hear a man talk to his family on Thursday, and by Friday morning, they're putting a sheet over him and willing him out he had died. She said, so while I'm living in great faith, I'm seeing in the natural opportunities to be afraid. And it's scaring me because I trust the Lord, but everything in my world in this ICU is speaking contrary to the life of what it is that I believe God's had for me. I said, Lisa, I can't even imagine. She said, I said, what did you do? She said, Pastor, I'd love to say I made this up, but this is just too good. She said, Pastor, I don't know what it was, but I kept saying, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the, I'm going to get out of here so I can walk in the power of God because the joy of the Lord is my strength. As my days are, so my strength shall be. She said, before too long, it turned into a worship song right there in the ICU that the joy, 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 joy of the Lord is my strength. What are you saying? I'm saying I don't care how bad it looks. I don't care how lonely it looks. I don't care how, how just crazy it looks. The joy of the Lord will be your strength today. How's your joy meter? Somebody prophesy joy over your life today. How many of you this morning as a testimony has seen God be faithful to you? Slip up that hand. You've seen God be faithful to you. Slip up that hand. I always want you to reflect back and praise him for that time he brought you out. Now, if he was faithful then, he'll be faithful now. And I dare you to praise him for what it is that he is about to take you through. I've seen him do it before, and I'll see him do it again. Somebody lift up a praise. I see you move. I see. 
want you, if you're comfortable, put your hand on your belly. Put your hand on your belly. Not, not because it's your stomach, but the Bible says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Put your hand right there on your belly. And I want you to rub it. I don't want you to rub it in a circle. And according to Scripture, I say by the laying on of hands, we stir up the gift of God on the inside of you. We stir up the gift of God. I don't, don't do it because I'm just telling you to do it. But stir up, fan the flame. It's been dormant for too long. It's been excused for too long. It's settled down on the inside of you. But I hear the Lord saying, I'm trying to give rivers of living joy to bust out of you today. And I say, stir up. By the laying on of hands, stir up the gift of God on the inside of you. That gift that has been given to you as a child before you were conceived in your mother's womb. We stir it up in the name of Jesus. Living water, living joy, living Living water, yes. living joy, yes. head, not the tail, yes. above, not, beneath, not afraid, not full of anxiety, not full of fear, not isolated, not lonely, not weary, not broken, not victimized. You are more than a conqueror. Joy is your portion. It's your portion. Somebody give him a praise for great joy that's on the way. That's a suddenly for somebody. Give him a praise for great joy that is on the way. thank you Jesus we thank you Jesus now if you got a Christmas praise in you give it to him all over this room Amen. Nick run to Isaiah 9 6 I, I, I can't move past this moment and his name shall be called wonderful Today, if you've been wondering if God's in your life, I heard the Lord say, I'm wonderful. <laughs> Shake us again, God. Surprise us again. For every stagnant believer that thinks because they've been with you for a few minutes, they know all that you are. Become wonderful again. If you're in this room this morning, you're watching and you're, you're trying to make decisions. I pray that the counselor would come into your life. The Holy Spirit would come right now. And he would provide direction and inspiration for you. Wonderful counselor. Mighty. For those of you that are in weak seasons, you're in a weak place. You're in a struggling place. You're in a weary place. You're in a low place. You don't feel like you have the strength. I pray that the mighty God would show up. The warring God, the warrior God would show up in the strength of his might. It's not by your might. It's not by your power. But it comes by the spirit of the sovereign Lord over your life. And I pray for the wind of the spirit to blow into your life in Jesus name who is God who is the God of this age not only the God of this age but everlasting for those of you that feel like it's being fizzled out it's being faded out I heard the Lord say there is an everlastingness that is coming in this moment for those of you that have struggled with identity because of parental relationships and dysfunctions I pray that the father to the fatherless the mother to the motherless would be unlocked in your life in this season everlasting father and the prince of of peace for every person that has been in a storm for every person that has had to struggle to hold their peace the prince of peace is taking his place over top of the turbulence of your life right now in the name of Jesus because Christ is with us we thank you for it in Jesus name in Jesus name somebody one last time give him the ovation of the morning Amen. Listen, before we leave today, two things. Number one, Merry Christmas. I pray that this is the greatest Christmas of great joy that you've ever had, not because of what's under the tree, but because who got off of the tree. Come on. If your joy is contingent upon what's under the tree, you've missed the point of this season. That was free. Number one, Merry Christmas. And I pray that you are a merry Christian. 
Number two, before we leave today, I want to give you the opportunity to be a miracle tangibly. You saw two U-Haul trucks sitting out there in the, um, in the parking lot. We talked about this last week, right after this service, 10, at 1245. We're going to leave, hopefully. We had a house fire of a family. How many kids did they have? Four? They have three children. Had a house fire a couple months ago. Pastor Mac has been driving point on this. <clears throat> and they lost everything, their vehicles, the whole nine yards. Um, we have an apartment full of furniture that we need to go pick up and bring to a storage unit to prepare them for as they're building, they have this stuff ready. And then those of you that know, we partner with Human Coalition, which is an agency here in our city for women who have the courage to choose life and not abortion. <clears throat> with that, that, this particular family that we sponsored, they had a house, an apartment fire as well, and they need furniture. So there's actually two places, two different directions we're gonna go to pick up furniture to bring to a storage unit here close by the church. And maybe you can't afford to be a miracle financially, but you got a little bit of muscles. Or maybe you don't have a lot of muscles, but you have a really good hug. So you can love on these people, speak life out of these people, or whatever, while we're, we're all moving this furniture. It won't take, listen, you'll be in and out by 3 o'clock. I mentioned it last week. I know some of you are like, but I'm hungry. Listen, I, I got an extra mint. Hallelujah. You probably don't want this one, but I'll give you one. I will. And you have the opportunity to be literally a miracle for two families that have gone through house fires. Again, if the point of church is to come here and have heaven invade but nothing changes out there, what's the point? I mean, really, what's the point? I, I'm not eternally preparing myself for the good old gospel ship. I want to load that joker up so we all get to go home together. Um, and so I'm just inviting you to stay. Pastor Mike's going to drive um, the directions of the two vehicles, of the two U-Haul trailers. You can follow behind us. We're all going to load it back up at the storage unit here. And I'm just providing an opportunity for you to literally be the hands and feet of Jesus today. What a miracle. You've already put shoes in snow-covered places. Those of you that support us financially at Judah, steward here. You've already provided heat for the entire winter months at the Dakotas. You've already provided a massive turnaround in the nation of Honduras today. You've heard those things. But I thank God for what he does around the world. But I also believe in taking care of Judea and Samaria. And I, I believe in world projects, but I also believe in home too. Why would, why, I don't want us to starve giving it all away. And so we have families in our church who want to be a blessing to. And we try to be balanced here in our approach and outreach. I just want to challenge you. You'll be, I promise, be in and out 3 o'clock very latest if we have enough people now if it's just me and my family it's going to be a little bit longer and I'm going to try not to pray bad things over you I'm just kidding <clears throat> in all seriousness it's an opportunity for us to be a blessing and a miracle Pastor Mac will be out there right by the U-Haul she'll give you the slip of paper the address maybe you can help us load but you can't stay to unload no problem awesome maybe you, maybe you need because of physical issues you've got to go eat but you'll meet us at the storage unit to unload that is amazing you don't have to do the whole thing. You can pick one or the other if you don't have the time because of it being a spare of the moment or, or last minute thing for you. But the greatest thing we can do is be a gift to someone else. Somebody say amen. <clears throat> and the furniture is already there. We've already heard it's there. We're going to go there to see it. And we're going to put it in the hands of people that have lost everything. But they said family. You can lose all your stuff and thank God you still have family and that's enough. Somebody say amen. That's what we're there to do. So maybe you can't, you're busy, you got a whole lot of things. No shame. I would never put a guilt trip on you unless it's offering time. It's just what good preachers do. <clears throat> that's why I never take up the offerings. And so um, I just want to pray over you before you leave today if this is my last time seeing you before Christmas is over with. Father, thank you for great joy that is our portion. Thank you that peace is on earth and goodwill has been extended to all men. We receive that peace into our life and now we extend it to people that have gone through great tragedy. I pray for every son and daughter in this room, for every father, for every mother, for every family member in this house, Lord, that this season would be a season of prophetic de declarations of the great joy, even in unhappy times maybe, that great joy is still their portion to hold on to. 
according to your word in Deuteronomy 111, increase us a thousand times more than what you are and fulfill every single promise that you have given us. In the name of the Father, the freedom of the Son, the power of the Spirit of God, we say yes and amen and Merry Christmas. God bless you. We love you today. Have an incredible rest of the week and have an awesome Christmas time. God bless you. Thank you.